The following is an Operation Podcast production. What is the difference between longevity and anti-aging? Mm. Is aging a disease? Do you view those two things mm. differently at all? No. No, aging is not a disease. Um, humans are very good agers. It is a, a fundamental feature of life. I don't think there's any evidence that there's a technology that's going to allow people to extend maximal human lifespan. But I do think that there are things that we can do that mm. will allow us to age better. Resveratrol is probably the, you know, the, 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 the biggest um, stench, it, it's face, garbage. Right? Are there examples in mammalian biology where single genes um, can extend lifespan? Yes. Would you want to have those genes? Would you want to have your growth hormone pathway inactivated? No, you would not. So SIR2 is like the founding member of a gene family okay. called sir 2 They are not longevity genes. We could summarize our conversation and boil it down to one statement about NAD. What would it be? NAD is, the, this is Dr. Charles Brenner. I'm a professor at City of Hope in Duarte, California, and it was super fun to be here on Ever Forward Radio. Charlie, great to have you here. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. What is the difference between longevity and anti-aging? Mm. Is aging a disease? Do you view those two things mm. differently at all? No, no, aging is not a disease. Aging is a fundamental feature of animal life. But um, as far as mammals are concerned, um, you know, particular mammalian species all have a distribution, a normal distribution in which um, we get to sexual maturity and then some animals are able to maintain their capacity as, a, as adults for a long period of time. Some animals basically reproduce once, one and done, right? And really don't have a whole lot of longevity. Um, humans are very good agers. Um, aging isn't a disease. It is a, a fundamental feature of life. I mean, I consider um, the, the, the part of life between fertilization of an egg and, our, and through our puberty and reaching sexual maturity, I consider that a component of aging. And then what we're trying to do is we're trying to maintain our capacity for as long as possible, um, be able to provide for others, mm. um, be able to run, um, you know, a mile and get up stairs and think hard problems and do hard things. And um, we do lose capacity as we age um, beyond our, our sexual maturation. When you say capacity, and, what exactly are you referring to in the human experience? We're trying to maintain our capacity. What is that? Uh, you know, it means that you're not going to, um, your 70-year-old self is not going to beat your 20-year-old self in a 100-meter in a sprint, right? Um, your 70-year-old um, self may be able to, you know, will beat your seven-year-old self in a game of chess, right? But um, there are, you know, there's, there's capacities, right? There's I'm abilities, physical, physical, physical ability. mental, um, and um, so we mature physically. Um, we mature um, mentally and emotionally, right? D different rates. And then basically when we're adults, we're trying to maintain our functions, right? So we're trying to maintain our physical functions. We're trying to retain our, you know, our mental capacity. And so that's what healthy aging is. And um, so I'm very interested in, you know, in longevity as, mm -hmm. as, as most, most people are. Um, I don't think there's any evidence that um, there's a technology that's going to allow people to extend maximal human lifespan. I don't either consider aging a disease, but I do think that there are things that we can do that will allow us to age better. And we're going to get there. Absolutely. But while we're still on the topic of longevity and anti-aging, when do we start aging? And is there an age or age period that is the ideal time to begin adopting anti-aging habits, you think? Okay. So I'm not fully comfortable with the word anti-aging mm. um, because I don't quite know what you mean by it. Um, I'm. Do any of us really know what we mean by it? Well, the reason I bring it up is because it is so 
top of mind, dare I even say trendy right now. And I'll be totally honest, I think about the concept of anti-aging pretty often. It, it's very much a part of my personal and professional world. So yeah. please well, so, enlighten so us to if, it, if it's maintaining repair capacity and re and maintaining our, um, our power and our function, then I'm all for it, right? If it's, if it's a counterfactual narrative that we don't have to age, um, you know, this is probably under the belief that some people have, or some people claim that aging is in fact a disease, but your stance is that aging is not a disease. So therefore anti-aging is not really what we, we think it is. Well, the, 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 the first of all, anti-aging is, um, it's just a, a sort of a hazardous term and mm -hmm. it, it means a lot of different things, right? So, um, anti-aging is kind of like a, um, is a, is a marketing term for cosmetics and for, um, you know, procedures in a, in a, in a, in a skincare clinic or, mm -hmm. or med spa that, um, don't fundamentally change very much. Right. So you can take, you know, uh, botulinum toxin, right. Botox. Right. And, um, you can take an injection into a neuromuscular junction, right? Mm -hmm. And you can get a forehead so that it doesn't show wrinkles, right? And so you and can improve people people's- people think that as anti-aging. Right, I mean, that, that, that is an anti-aging treatment, right? It, it, doesn't, it certainly doesn't affect a root cause of aging. The anti-aging category is such a big thing. Um, so it, in part, it includes things like that that are, that are superficial, mm -hmm. right? Um, in part, it includes things that are totally counterfactual, right? What would be an example of that, um, in your opinion? Resveratrol is probably the, you know, the, 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 the biggest um, stench out there. Open right? that up for us a little bit, please, because I remember about 20 years ago when I was starting my, you know, 20, 21 years ago, starting my personal wellness journey, resveratrol was the shit. It was yeah. the biggest keyword. It was popping in all the key supplements and the brands that I was looking at. And it was this promise that we have cracked the aging code. It is going to, I, I might be paraphrasing some stuff here, but I even think like, you know, increasing telomere length and increasing the quality of like everything at the cellular level, reducing aging, adding quality and quantity years to your life. How'd that turn out? Well, now we see we have the science, right? Well, like 10, 15, 20 years later, it's really, it's kind of falling flat it, on its, it's face. It's garbage. Right? Okay. Wow. So, so, I mean, all right. So resveratrol was a known natural product for, for a very long time. Right. Um, by the way, it's not only in, you know, red wine, it's, it in, pe it's in peanuts. Great. Peanuts. No, it's, it's in a lot, it's in a lot of plants. It's a, really? it's a, it's a phytonutrient. phytonutrient. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a polyphenolic compound. Um, it has some mild antioxidant properties. It's related to a lot of other compounds. And, um, and certainly, you know, it's in red wine, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so um, it was described in, I think, a 2003, if I have the, the year right, um, paper, right. Yeah. Uh, nature paper, as an activator of a particular enzyme, okay? Um, there's a yeast enzyme called SIRT2. There's a human version called SIRT1, S-I-R-T-1. And the report was that resveratrol, as well as a number of other um, um, molecules, increased the activity mm. of, of, this, of this enzyme. It was a biochemical assay, mm. okay? It didn't actually increase the activity of the of the SIRT2 enzyme, didn't actually increase the activity of the SIRT1 enzyme. And the ac even increasing the activity of the SIRT2 enzyme only extends lifespan for one out of five million yeast cells. How interested in, 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 in that are you? Hold up. So how can this be? How can this, is this only because now we have years to look at the data? How can we go from something that is discovered hype. and is so widely accepted to bullshit? In one word, hype. It was okay. all hype. You're saying there was no scientific so, data. So, so, it, 
some of it was honest mistakes. Mm. Um, but um, the the fact that it was so it's called a biochemical artifact, right? Which means that um, let's say um, let's say we we identify you know a drug target. You know, um, you told me that you know one of your most popular um, you know episodes was about nitric oxide. Nitric oxide. Shout synthase, out Dr. Liu, yeah. right? Okay, so let's say let's say um, somebody wants to inhibit nitric oxide synthase or somebody wants to activate nitric oxide synthase, right? For, you know, something about, you know, erections or something about cancer, whatever, health. whatever yeah, it is yeah. that they want to do, right? So they identify a particular enzyme and they say, okay, so we want drugs mm. to whatever they decide to do. They want to inhibit the enzyme. They want to activate the enzyme, okay? So they're going to set up a biochemical experiment in which they want to see whether these small molecules interact, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, you, you can't see enzymes under a microscope. They're too small, okay? So you have to link them to something that generates a fluorescent signal, an optical signal. We're going to do something where the enzyme does something and then yada, 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 you get a fluorescent signal, okay? And um, then you have to do controls, okay? You have to make sure that um, the, the, the drug candidate, in this case resveratrol, which was reported to be a SIR2 activator, um, you have to do controls to make sure that, the, that it wasn't just affecting the assay there's something happens at the level of the enzyme, then there's yada, 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 and then you get a fluorescent signal, okay? okay? By within one year of the Nature paper um, that reported that resveratrol is an activator of, of CERT2 and CERT1, it was already reported by two different groups that it was a fluorescent artifact. So in one year, it within one year, fell. Biochemists already knew that resveratrol was not hitting its target, that it was disturbing the fluorescent assay that was being used to measure the enzyme activity. I feel like this is the fall of the biochemical Roman Empire. It, there was so much hype around, even still now. But I hear. no, but the thing, even still, that's yeah. the problem, right? So, so biochemists knew that the result was wrong. Mm. Okay. Um, Similar at the same time, okay, there was this narrative that um, the SIR2 gene is a dominantly acting monogenic longevity gene in everything from yeast to people. Okay, Let's okay, say in, in, in layman's terms, okay, la that's means. a lot of vocabulary there. So, longevity is basically how long an organism lives, right? Um, and um, like worms live for let's say three weeks, and flies may live for two months, and 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 mice live for you know two three years, and people live on average eighty some years with maximum um, credible um, data saying that somebody lived to one hundred and twenty two, right? Uh, and very few people you know live into a hundred one hundred and ten, mm -hmm. and um, so. Um, there are, as we were saying before, before we started, there are some rare genes mm. in mice where you inactivate a single gene and you get a very long-lived mouse. But the, it inactivates genes in growth factor pathways, mm -hmm. right? Pituitary pathways. And these mice... Meaning the physical maturation of the animal Yeah, if you... Disrupt limited. growth factor mm -hmm. or growth factor receptor. You can get tiny mice that cannot do thermoregulation. They can't keep them, mm -hmm. themselves warm. They can't compete for food and they don't sexually mature. But they do live twice as long. If you separate them and wow. you give them adopted sisters, 
to keep them warm and you make sure they have enough food, they can live twice as long as normal mice. So that's what's called a monogenic longevity gene. Okay. Okay. That you inactivate a single gene, both copies actually. You inactivate both copies, you can get a very long lived mouse. Mm. Is that a way to live, by the way? Absolutely. I feel, I feel sorry for the mouse. I, I mean, yeah. well, he's got there, two, three more years of life, but at what cost? Right. I mean, and there are actually people um, with mutations in this pathway. They're, it's called Lerone syndrome. Mm. They're very small. Um, and they Is don't- dwarfism? Yeah, it's a type but of- Even smaller than that? It, no, it's yeah. a type of- uh, uh, these are called dwarf mice. Because this and was the, uh, the study that I was pulling up, actually. I found um, this work by Dr. David Sinclair talking about this, and it really made me pause to think, to your point, yeah, you found this mutation these, in these dwarf mice. You're able to snip right. it, okay. but so, then they lived longer, but like, okay, their so we're doing now, sucked. We're doing nuance now, mm -hmm. right? Are we doing nuance here? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so is it true that there are some genes mm -hmm. in a mouse that will extend its lifespan. Yes. Mm. Okay. Um, is it, um, and it, and it's cancer free. So in, in some ways looks good, but does it involve, um, healthy function? No, they can't thermoregulate. They don't sexually mature. They can't compete for food. The people with this mutation don't actually live longer. Right. Mm. So it's, so are there examples in, you know, from, from mammalian biology where single genes um, can extend lifespan, yes. Would you wanna have those genes? Would you wanna have your growth hormone pathway inactivated? No, you would not. Right, right. Because you would not right. have muscle mass. You would not have sexually matured. You would not be able to compete for food. You would not be um, you know, married to a very capable um, nurse practitioner, as you've told me, right? Yes, she is. And um, so all, all, all of those things, right? So on the other hand, you know, um, if, if there were single genes that were really beneficial for life that were dominantly acting, hmm. right? We would all want those genes, right? So um, for about 25 years, We've been told that a class of genes called sirtuins are those genes, right? And the initial report came out of the 1990s, right? In a very productive, you know, yeast molecular biology lab mm. that um, showed that extra copies of a gene called sir2 um, extended. Um, one type of lifespan in yeast, right? What do you mean one type of lifespan? Okay, so so the yeast is baker's yeast, mm -hmm. right? Um, just before driving down here to Santa Monica, um, I put together the, you know, the dough for, for tonight's dinner, right? So the same organism, Saccharomyces cervis, okay. yeah, baker's yeast. Um, and... Um, so um, you can monitor aging of, of yeast in two different ways. One of them is basically under a microscope mm -hmm. where you take a, a new cell and you see how many times it can divide and produce what are called daughter cells. Mm -hmm. To so some degree. So you're looking at, you know, you basically, you have to kind of install a, a, a graduate student or a or a postdoc in front of a microscope for two weeks, right? And every first they array these these yeast cells, single mm -hmm. cell. It's like it's not a, it's not an animal, okay? Right. It's single a single cell, cell fungus. Yeah. Even as far as fungi are concerned, it's a very simplistic model, okay? I, and I, I I don't have anything against yeast. I actually started my career doing yeast molecular biology, so that's why I understand these these models so so well. So, um, and we've done them in our own lab as well. We just don't overinterpret the mm -hmm. results. So um, you are, are following the number of times, you know, a single cell will divide, mm -hmm. right? And um, 
The observation was that if you give them extra copies of this SIR2 gene, that rather than dividing about 21 times, they will divide around 25 or 26 times, okay? So that's, that's good. But that's only for the oldest mothers in the culture. Hmm. Because if you go back to the culture, right? So think about, um, you know, a flask of yeast, right? Okay. Or the yeast that is growing in the pizza dough that is sitting on, on my countertop right now. 50% of the cells are new cells that have never been a mother. I see. Right? I see. Right. 50% right. of them yeah. are new cells. Yeah. 25% yeah. of the cells have divided one time. Right? One out of eight of the cells have divided two times. And so it's okay. that Galifianakis hangover math scene here. Right, right. So, so it turns out the advantage of having extra copies of SIR2 hmm. advantages one out of five million cells. And you can, five re million. you can regenerate the culture from any one cell. So wow. it's, it's what we call not a selected trait. Okay, so it's interesting that SIR2 does something for that yeast, old mother yeast cell, that it can divide mm. four or five more times when it's produced a lot of daughters. Wow. Wow. But it's totally irrelevant wow. for animal life. Totally irrelevant. Okay, so what I'm hearing in this is I think a huge- So SIR2 is not even a good target. Right, right, for, right, right. For, for what you would want to, yeah. what you care about right. in terms of animal aging. What matters in animal aging is tens of thousands of thousands, if not tens of thousands of different genes interacting with each other, not the SIRT1 gene. And when yeah. people initially said, okay, um, let's see if, if SIR2 related genes are important in worms and flies. They initially reported that extra copies of, of the worm and fly SIRT gene extends lifespan in worm and flies, which is mind blowing to me that a yeast gene that's not even important until there's millions of offspring, mm -hmm. um, that that somehow anticipates the causes of aging in animals, that would be mind blowing to me. Ooh, yeah, and yeah, guess what? Yeah. It's not true. Wow. And so just as the resveratrol thing mm. was not reproducible and was an artifact, the idea that cert one homologs and worms and flies extend lifespan is non-reproducible. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when um, literally something like 10 years later, after the initial reports that um, cert genes extend lifespan in worms and flies, when that was repeated by a group of investigators that carefully looked at the strain backgrounds, um, the effect went away. Wow, went away. Went away. So that means anybody what? that is writing books into you know 2019 or is on podcasts in 2023 or is on Instagram in 2024 that is telling you that sirtuins are longevity genes and that resveratrol is an activator of longevity genes is intentionally obfuscating and spreading debunked information. A few okay, of those come to mind. A few of those people come to mind. That's the problem here because those people have a massive amount of influence and their ideas are essentially non-falsifiable. Okay. Well, couldn't you say that at the time and the few that come to mind that we talked about off air, um, anybody who's interested in longevity, you could probably just research and figure out um, the bigger names out there. Did, were they not just going off of the best data, the best science that they had at the time and coming to the best conclusion? And unbeknownst to them, a year, several years later, this really isn't holding the same weight. So like, what fault can we place on them? Or is it just a matter of science needs to out science, old science kind of thing? We just got to wait it out. 
It's, it's a brutally um, difficult problem to solve right now because there are, um, like in late 2022, I wrote a comprehensive review of this topic entitled Sirtuins Are Not Conserved Longevity Genes. And I went all the way back through the original data and I described how the SIR2 gene was discovered in 1975, actually. Really? Wow. Yeah. It was but from the, from the mid-1970s and the work of um, Jasper Rhine and Ira Herskowitz, it was known that the SIR2 gene regulates mating type in yeast. Okay? Hmm. You probably didn't know this, but, hmm. um, you know, yeast has... Yeast is really interesting. Um, it sounds like yeast is lit. Yeast is cool. <laughs> it's cool. It's not relevant to human aging. I hang out with some yeast. It, it, actually, it is relevant to to, hu to human cell cycle and cancer biology that we yeah, use we, for we bread, time, beer, yeah. um, wine. People have been carrying it around in you know in clay pots for thousands of years, right? Um, I mean, I used to you know give give lectures in which. I showed um, pictures from Ur, where um, you know the, the 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 father of the Abrahamic religions, right? Abraham was was from you know Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. modern day Iraq, mm -hmm. between the Tigris and Euphrates the fertile rivers. Fertile crescent, baby. Right. That's right. He was from a city called Ur. Uh -huh. Okay, and the, you can find artwork from Ur where um, there are basically crocs. And people are drinking some type of fermented beverage. I don't know if it was more like a beer or more like a wine. Um, oh, my money's on Kukion. Have you read The Immortality Key? That's a whole other tangent, but you familiar with it? If I say Kukion, do you know what I'm talking about? No, I don't. All right. I got a book for you. Okay. Yeah, I got <laughs> a book for good. you. Everybody but, check out The Immortality but, Key. But basically, we've been carrying around yeast in, in, you know, in, in, in pottery for thousands of years, right? We've been cultivating yeast, and yeast helped cultivate and civilize us just as this, in the same way that you know growing grains and growing rice and figuring out agriculture and figuring out you know transportation led to you know advanced uh, civilization right and you're saying even so so we've had these times this was present and aware of and people were actually making people, sure to have it on them people had they didn't know how it worked but so they yeast is good. cool yeast is cool so so <laughs> so so there's there's a diploid phase of yeast there's a haploid phase of yeast and um and the sir2 gene mm. is a was was discovered in the 1970s SIR2, it actually stands for silent information regulator, hmm. okay? And it basically, the SIR2 gene um, has a role in turning off a particular gene so that a haploid cell can mate. It, it's actually- For my own understanding and maybe the audience, when we say SIR2 and sir 2 are these the same things? Sirtuin is a, like a family of related genes, okay. right? Because th that was the yeah. term for me. And they're I, involved in epigenetic regulation, okay? okay. So, um, but it's not the same thing, but similar. No, uh, so Sir2 is like the founding member of a gene family okay. called Sirtuins, okay. right? Okay, okay. They are not longevity genes. That doesn't mean that they're not interesting. Like I, I'm saying, they, they're involved in gene regulation, okay? But they're, they, they don't do magical things in all of our cells. They don't promote you know, longevity in animals. Resveratrol doesn't activate them. They don't mediate the beneficial effects of NAD boosting. You know, they're, they're, kind of sounds like a lot of what I've heard them described to do. Right, right. Interesting. Right. I need a fact so, checker on this one. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, so a lot of you know, what I've had to do in the last few years is to try to, you know, set the, the record straight. I mean, NAD is important because NAD is the central catalyst of metabolism. And um, metabolism is converting everything that we eat into everything that we do and everything that we are. Um, and NAD is a carrier of high energy electrons that allow us to generate ATP and 
ha- allow us to make nucleotides and lipids and repair ourselves. And we're, we're here. Yeah. Uh, can we please? I, I wanted to transition definitely into NAD. And since we're already here, before I kind of let you finish that train of thought, excuse the interruption, can we define NAD? What is it? Um, yeah. Why, why should we care about it? Yeah. So, so NAD, it's, a, it's an abbreviation for a mouthful. Um, for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Okay. It's actually four different um, coenzymes. These are mm. small molecules. They're not proteins. Um, they're not nucleic acids. Um, they're not lipids, but they're, they're coenzymes that are required to make all of those things. Mm. Okay. So a, 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 um, what they do is it's a, it's a dinucleotide, so it um, it contains uh, something that's related to ATP, and then it contains something related to nicotinamide, which is a vitamin. Okay, um, one of the mm-hmm. cycles of life is that we all living now. I'm going to embrace all living things, bacteria and and plants and and fungi and, and animals, all living things um, need a source of energy, right? Um, most of the living things that we're familiar with are what are called autotroph, or uh, sorry, are heterotrophic, which means that we get energy from outside, right? So um, we... Um, we don't autonomously create the energy necessary for capacity for life. Right. That's right. So if we you have to wa- consume food so, stuff. So, for so, so, so here's, here's my, my intro to biology. Okay. Okay. My intro to biology is that if we were to step outside of the studio, we would see the sun. Okay. 93 million miles away. Mm. Right. The sun is sending photons to the planet earth. Right. And um, the photons are captured by plants. Plants are using that um, solar energy and carbon dioxide as a carbon source, right? And they're growing plant matter, right? Plant protein, plant fat, and plant carbohydrate. Then animals come along and eat the plant matter, okay? And we come along and we either eat the plants directly or we eat the animals that eat the plants. Uh-huh. And so we're heterotrophs. We're taking in energy, right? That's the circle Because of life. we have to basically, yeah. we have to deal with the fact, the facts of physics, right? And physics tells us, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that there is a tendency towards entropy in the universe, Right, and entropy if is entropy is disorder. Like if we if we rack a you know a um, fifteen balls on a billiard table, right today, and then we come back after there's time and temperature added to the system, those those balls are not going to be where we they started. Mm. Right, they're going to be jiggled away. They may be jiggled away a little. They may be jiggled away a lot. That's actually how you can measure time in some sense. Oh, okay, all right. right. If I can, pull, not to derail <laughs> this part too much, but I'm just thinking, sure, that might make sense. And I might just be thinking too literal here. But if if that happened like in a house, someone might say like, okay, like vibrations coming in and out of living. Yeah. If we took that exact same billiard table, put it in a, a vacuum, would that also happen? Um, in a vacuum. So I'm not a physicist. In, in a suspended place, are we saying that entropy, the natural tendency of entropy will still exist? Um, entropy exists. And the only thing that opposes it is an influx of energy. Okay. 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 So, so, so the thing is, so living and, and, and people come up to me and they say, well, doesn't a growing you know, animal violate the second law? And the answer is, no, it doesn't violate the second law because, I mean, a growing thing, um, like a dividing oocyte going from the one cell stage to the two cell stage to the 14, 16, 
as the four, six, 16, et cetera stage is actually increasing in complexity. Hmm. And, a, and, and a baby is growing and increasing in complexity, right? But all of that requires energy input. Growing things can increase their complexity, right? And we can keep our S together, right? Right, right. And we can only um, self-repair, right, and keep our S together by um, the homeostatic forces of life and taking in energy. So we have a complex gene set and we have metabolism mm. that allows us to repair ourselves, okay? Um, NAD coenzymes, all four NAD coenzymes, are the key um, connection between taking in energy and um, converting it to biological power in the form of ATP okay. and conforming it to biological materials, the proteins and fats and carbohydrates that build our cells mm -hmm. and build our organs and, and all of our capacity. So NAD coenzymes are the critical wiring of life that carries high energy electrons that allows life to be possible. And then the connection between NAD and aging is that as we go through life, our NAD system comes under attack in many different ways. Um, we've what shown- What would be an example of that? So um, alcohol, you know, being almost the most obvious one. That's something that was known before our lab got into NAD. How does alcohol affect NAD? So, so alcohol metabolism primarily occurs in the liver, okay? And um, ethanol gets converted to acetaldehyde, which is toxic. Mm. And then acetaldehyde gets converted into um, acetate, which is pretty much non-toxic. But... Um, in the course of converting ethanol to acetate, um, NAD accepts electrons from the ethanol over two different cycles. Oh, wow, wow. And it, NAD plus get, gets converted to NADH, and it basically puts the liver into a more lipogenic state. Hmm. It puts the liver into a state in which it's less able to accept fuel and convert it into energy, and it is more capable of converting fuel into fat. So is this, am I understanding correctly, is this fatty liver disease? Is this kind of what happens so, there? So B besides uh, cirrhosis. So yeah, the, the, the initiation of you know, fatty liver is from what's called de novo lipogenesis in, in, in hepatocytes where hepatocytes are taking in fuel, right? And um, converting, so there are different things that the hepatocyte can do, right? The hepatocyte can take in fuels and convert to ATP, mm -hmm. right? The hepatocytes can take in fuels and um, like overnight, for example, um, there's fatty acids that are being released mm -hmm. that hepatocytes are taking up. Mm -hmm. And um, to some degree, and the, and the liver is tr actually trying to make glucose mm -hmm. overnight. Mm -hmm. The liver is trying to make- A primary um, energy source, one of. Right, so, so, so the liver can, can store glucose as glycogen, mm -hmm. it can, take um, uh, glycogenic and gluconeogenic uh, precursors, and it can, it, can, it can produce glucose for the bloodstream, it can produce glycogen that, it gets, that it's stored, mm -hmm. it can do all of its biosynthetic processes, mm -hmm. it can make and store lipids, it can make and export cholesterol, right, it can make you know, steroid hormones to some degree. Um, but um, fatty liver, which is, you know, a function of overnutrition, right? 
and also a function of alcohol intake, you know, uh, involves a disturbance to the NAD system that we're very interested in. So I'm going to do my best to boil that down in a very simple way. Mm -hmm. Drinking alcohol directly limits the function of our NAD system in your liver. Yep. And our liver, which I think most people would kind of like, yeah, I'm already kind of aware of that, but the direct correlation to NAD dysfunction is immediate in any amount of alcohol. Like, Oh, you know, I, I don't want to pathologize life. Right. right. So I, you know, I, I I'm not going to pathologize aging. Right. Um, and I'm not going, I mean, we, we can go through the list of, of things that disturb the NED system and yeah, then we can yeah. decide which, which ones we want to pathologize. Yeah, let, me, let me rein it in. Okay. Uh, this is where so, my, uh, so, my brain wants to go so, off. So, so, but overnutrition, okay. Uh-huh. Which is eating too much. Yeah, let's bring it back to NAD. So, um, overnutrition, um, disturbs the NED system. We showed that, um, overnutrition meaning consuming too many calories than yep, necessary. Yep. Okay. So, um, so we, a number of years ago, we put mice on, on a high fat diet um, we gave them obesity. Basically, we pushed them into mm. a mouse model of type two diabetes. We saw their liver NAD system under attack. Okay, in the case of alcoholism, um, some of that work predated us, but then we showed in humans with mm. alcoholic liver disease, their NAD system in their liver is disturbed. Wow. It's been shown that sunlight. Um, you know, our, our skin is exposed to ultraviolet radiation that damages DNA. In that process, um, you know, um, NAD is used to repair DNA, hmm. okay? I don't want to pathologize sunlight, but ultraviolet radiation hmm. is a way to accelerate the aging of the skin. Use sunscreen, okay? Hmm. I th- pe- There are people on podcasts that have pathologized sunscreen, sunscreen. I think that is not okay. That right I think yeah. that's not okay. Hmm. I mean, um, you know, uh, you know, sun exposure without sunscreen is responsible for skin cancer and premature aging of skin. There's no question about that. But it, you're saying all sun exposure, isn't it? Um, here, here's what I've been led to believe. Yeah. I will say this, what, you know, what I look at in podcasts, yeah. influencers and research even is certain times and duration. So if I'm, duration, if I'm outside under the sun between like 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., we'll say for a long period of time, consistently day after day, week after week, month after month, boom, potentially skin cancer. And I actually have melanoma in my family, so it's very top of mind for me. Compared to that with or without sunscreen, you're saying it's gonna go one way or the other? Um, well, absolutely, during you know peak sun exposure, and you know um, that's when it's most important. Mm-hmm. But if you go to, if you talk to, you know, I, I've been to, been fortunate enough to go to, um, you know, um, South Korea, like three times in, in the last couple of years where um, there's a huge amount of, you know, concern for, um, you know, skin, oh, skin yeah. aging, right? Yeah. There's a, in, in fact, um, NR, I'm, I'm a co-founder of a, of a company called Juvenis in, that's based in, in Seoul that has been able to formulate NR into skin mm-hmm. products. And, but if you talk to, you know, people in, in, in Korea, you know, um, they will tell you that um, sunscreen and, and physical barriers like, you know, umbrellas or, or mm-hmm. whatever is the most important first thing that you do, you know, to take care of your skin is to, you know, protect it from, from ultraviolet exp- exposure. And would so, you say that's also the best thing for the quality and health of our NAD? Um, so th- that... That's probably an overstatement. I mean, okay. we we know that we know that um, um, NAD is crucially important for DNA repair, you know, and that ultraviolet, you know, exposure, you know, activates an enzyme called PARP one that challenges the NAD system. We also know actually from from some research that this company Juventus has done that 
topical NR really works mm -hmm. and it actually improves skin elasticity when you know people applied the stuff to their skin for you know four and eight eight weeks um, two times a day there was a strongly measurable improvement in skin elasticity um, but I, I don't like to get you know way out over my skis and you know say things that are not evidence-based but mm. you know any NAD is crucially important for you know for repair okay and that that's really the use case for it so you know so I'm not one of these people that will sell, tell you you know take NR and then you don't have to age we are all aging we what we want to do is we want to age better we want to age with strong repair capacity we want to maintain our you know our, our strength and our mental acuity um, that's why there have been something like 80 registered clinical trials of NR in various diseases and conditions, including Parkinson's, mm -hmm. in which there's a positive signal. I think in mild cognitive impairment, there's a positive signal. Um, seven trials showed an anti-inflammatory effect of NR. Wow. So we think that you know you can age better. There's a use case for NR uh -huh. in aging better. Um, when, I, when I think um, aging better, I also think of a fundamental uh, concept. I, I think of mitochondria. Mitochondria is, is the popular kid on campus right now. I think the last couple of years, at least in, in my world. And I think we have a lot of things coming out now bringing, in my opinion, good research, yeah. but also potentially bringing misinformation around what does good functioning mitochondria mean? What does it mean to improve or increase the quantity and quality of mitochondria? Are we focusing maybe on the wrong thing? Should we be focusing on the quality and quantity of mitochondria or NAD? Do the two serve each other? What is the yeah, correlation they, they, between they, the two? They serve each other. I mean, uh, there's a little bit of podcast disease in, in, in this topic, oh, right? I know, I know. You, you know what I'm talking yeah. about, right? And and <laughs> what what podcast disease is, is a lot of highly for, specific mechanistic for people recognitions. people to know, it's, it's like I heard it on a podcast. Right. But if you say you heard it on Everford Radio, I allow it. <laughs> That's right. Oh, well. This podcast, you know, <laughs> is, is the exception, right? Please but, continue. But 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 people will 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 dive into these rabbit holes, and they emerge with very um, you know obsessive diet culture. Basically, um, they will you know pathologize carbohydrates, for example, or they will say that. Um, fixate on one thing and they'll fixate on, on it or they'll fixate on, it. On, on a whole bunch of different things um, like, um, you know, physical activity is is, is great and, and and sunlight is great and circadian biology is great. But no, you don't need to take a walk when the sun is at a particular angle, you know, to the horizon. healthy habits is running rampant right now. And one of them that I see a lot of is get your walk in in the morning the because it's the right amount of like red light, right? And then at night you no, got to walk no, because it's the right geez, amount of like blue geez. light. I might have them backwards. It's You're telling me this doesn't matter? Whatever is sustainable for a person. Sure. You're I agree. Coach, I agree. You I agree. understand this. People have kids. People have jobs. People have their own individual practices. But if we like take if, that if aside, you want to, if take you, that aside. No, I, you're, you're I'm saying, not willing to take it aside because the, th the thing that is going to help people the most is what they can sustain in their life, of course, right? Of course. And if, if somebody wants to, to, to if, if somebody, um, first of all, I seriously doubt um, that large percentages of people are functioning better without breakfast than with breakfast. There you're may be you're some referring people, to fasting, intermittent yeah, fasting. If there may be some people that for for whom it's great, but if like I'm a competitive person, okay, I'm a you know when you know my 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 wife ran a like a three twenty 
something marathon, right? Oh, wow. And so I don't like being the, you know, the second fastest person in my family, right? Because I ran cross country in, in high school and, you know, this is, this is not cool. You know, I can't run a, I can't run a four hour marathon, right? And there's somebody in my family who can run a 327 or whatever she did in Chicago. So, Damn. so, um, that's really good. And, and I compete in science and I, you know, compete in, in, in other things. And so if, if all of my competitors want to like go without breakfast, um, that's great for me. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm going to have breakfast because yeah. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to have my coffee right away. I'm going to have my breakfast and I'm going to be productive. I'm going to be able to exercise. I'm going to be able to think. I'm going to be able to do my work. I am wholeheartedly and I, with and, you. you know, so I'm, I'm personally on team yeah. breakfast. There's nothing an influencer could say to me that would change my feeling about breakfast because I've lived with breakfast. I live without breakfast. I function better on breakfast. Okay. I can work out better, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. a, a certain mm -hmm. amount. I can work out worse with a mm -hmm. ton of food in my system, right? But let me go back and ask, ask directly, just to, for clarification for the listener and the viewer here, our lifestyle allows us to do this. We'll, we'll just say this, right? And we choose to make it happen and we're able to make it consistently happen. Is there no value, no biological longevity, circadian rhythm value to walking to be exposed to the sun, i.e. certain wavelengths of light at certain times over the others. I think it's massively overstated. Okay, okay, fair. Massively okay. overstated. Interesting. I, I, I don't think you'd be able to pick up a signal in a properly done clinical trial. And, and, and I barely know anyone that, that thinks that you, you could. There, there certainly aren't data in, there All I are, hear is there the data. Are, there, are, there are not the super charismatic nucleus getting triggered to then fourteen to sixteen hours later begin the, to trigger. You're talking melatonin. about mechanisms, uh -huh. okay? So the, the, the and that's basically podcast disease. Podcast disease I'm is blown. when someone I'm says blown, guys. podcast disease is when someone starts talking about their autophagy. <laughs> they start talking about their mitochondria. They start talking about their autophagy. They start talking about their super chiasmatic nucleus. Okay. <laughs> so they're, they're talking about deep mechanisms yeah. and they're not talking about their performance. No. I'm talking to you about my performance, right? That if I Go, go, try to go to the gym and do the same things, mm -hmm, or if mm -hmm. I'm in a chess match and I try against the same type of, uh, you know, opponent, or if I'm trying to solve a problem in metabolism mm -hmm. and I try to do those things, you know, fed or fasted, I am going to perform better fed than fasted. Now there may be some things that I would do. And you better. know that through your own personal trial and error. Huge yeah. point. Yeah, I mean, I, the, I advocate that all day long. The the, the thing is, n equals so, one every day. But then you you can't then use your own experience to advocate what kind of diet or what kind of walk another person right, right, should take. Right. Because the kind of diet or the kind of walk the other person should take is the one that is sustainable for them. Okay. Now we understand enough about these diets. So first of all, um, you know whatever you know, you and I are doing with our dietary and lifestyle practices basically working, mm -hmm. right? So I, I'm, I'm 62, I'm jealous of somebody that can run a 325 marathon, but I'm doing okay, right? You know, um, and um, I'm competing with myself, right? I'm competing with my former mile time, right? And I'm competing with my you know, I want to be able to ski as well this year or better than I skied last year, right? I want to be able to be provide enough support and mm. and um, you know to everyone else around me as I this decade as I did last decade. I want to maintain my capacity, right? And cure but, all the podcast disease too, right? <laughs> but um, but um, if I told you. First of all, I don't know what percent of my macronutrients come from protein, fat, and carbohydrate. Um, 
But even if I did know what percentages they were for me, I wouldn't tell someone else that they have to be those percentages. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I do know from... And, and the diet um, is, is, is probably the most important thing that there is in managing that. You, there, there, are, there are quality data showing that you can't get to where you want to be by increasing physical activity alone because increasing physical activity will actually increase your hunger and your demand for food. And right. And so what we know from the GLP-1, you know, experience of the last, you know, three, four, four years is that um, these are drugs that work on the brain, mm. right, to, um, to reestablish satiety, mm. right, and they lower energy intake, right? They, they, it, it's so interesting Meaning because... Everybody, we feel fuller more often. People and therefore eat less when they take G, when right. they take yeah. you know semaglutide, right? Yeah. Or 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 ters, oh, ters appetite yeah. and all of that. The whole hypothesis, which are the keto bros out on, on the internet, you know, that are pathologizing carbohydrates, um, they would say that a drug that increases your insulin would be, would prevent you from losing weight. Mm. But those drugs were actually do increase your secretion of insulin. Uh, that's not the primary mechanism of weight loss. The primary mechanism of weight loss is that they also act on the brain mm -hmm. and they get people to push away from the, from the table and, and wow. eat less. So basically any diet that works for people that basically results in, you know, in weight loss is, is putting a person into a calorie deficit. And, and um, so the people that swear by ketogenic diet um, it's the, the ketogenic diet or a time restricted feeding or a low fat diet, you know, whatever it is that worked, if, if it worked, it put them into a calorie deficit. Okay. That's what we understand. What are the best things we can do to help the quality, the quantity, the efficiency of our NAD? Exercise. Yeah. The, be, the number one thing that you can do is to is to be active. While I, I you know, I, I just said that you you can't use exercise alone for you know significant you know weight weight loss. Um, it's incredibly important for life. It's incredibly important for everyone. Why, From, why specifically is exercise good for NAD? Well, what's I going mean, on there? I mean, first of all, exercise is essential for for everything right and um you know physical activity um improves people's mood improves people's mental function improves people's balance and resistance to falls and coordination reduces all-cause mortality yeah disease right. inflammation absolutely it also um increases NAD synthesis. Okay. Okay. And um, we don't have, I think that there actually are some data coming along that show that inactivity um, depresses NAD synthesis. There are certainly data that I've seen that that show mechanisms by which activity increases NAD synthesis. So it's not enough that we're, if we're not exercising, we're not getting better NAD or help, helping the health of our NAD, but actually being inactive reduces it. May, it, it may depress the NAD system, in fact, yeah. Wow. Um, certainly overnutrition does. Um, certainly, you know, overfeeding, alcohol does. Um, Is fasting a better approach in terms of nutrition or eating habits and timing 
for benefiting NAD. So you know what I'm about to tell, tell you. <laughs> I got to ask that, the questions. That, that, that I got to ask. I'm not, I'm not, so I'm basically, I'm not going to contribute to podcast disease. <laughs> okay. And I'm not going to advocate fasting. Obviously, neither am, am I going to advocate, you know, sleepwalking, right? So, so, so. Let's say so I choose to fast. I choose to intermittent fast and I only eat my eating window. I'm not saying this is true. I'm just, this is hypothetical. Okay. I eat between 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. Am I having better NAD or not? There's no human data for that. Hmm. Um, you know, um, so. But, um, it, but it could be personal for me. Like I, the N equals one, I could just find that I function better. If you I feel find better. that you function better and that, that that's that a sustainable practice. No, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have better NAD. Okay. okay. And I think that to, to, to start, you know, saying, oh yeah, you're optimizing your autophagy or you're optimizing your NAD. I think it's basically, um, sort of non falsifiable talking points. Um, I don't, find it very interesting. Um, I don't, um, you know, you, you, people have to do what is sustainable for them, right? So if you, if you, you, you want to do hard things, right? And then you want to see what allows you to do hard things, right? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. so um, you, you want to have some you want to have some sweat in your life, mm. right? So you want to have some heavy, heavy weight in, in, in your life. You want to have some, from, some fast movement in your life. I recently read a study that, that was remarkable that um, was looking at the effectiveness of, you know, um, antidepressants and a bunch of different lifestyle, you know, practices on, you know, mood, right? And antidepressants were effective, but, you know, not, super effective and activity was actually really effective. Yeah. And then the, the most amazing thing to me was that of all the activities, they tried to like subclassify different activities and they actually found dancing was the best damn really? thing. Oh, it probably, ha probably has a huge emotional connection thing. there as well. Cause most people, when you think most people, I think will accept the fact that exercise is good for the human experience. Now, um, are we having all going to enjoy doing joy, it? Having joy exactly. in your life exactly. is really important. Exactly. Okay. So, so doing things that make you miserable, <laughs> right? First of all, it's not going to be sustainable. Right. And second of all, it's not going to give you the whole body, whole brain, whole somatic joy yeah. that dancing or sex is going to have. Yeah. yeah. Right. So th some of the things, if we want to circle back to, to, to longevity, you know, some of the best things are, you know, joy mm. um, and, um, you know, physical activity and mental activity and social engagement. Um, I think dancing is, a, is amazing. Um, I think oh, being I love outside. I, I'm no good at it, but I do it all the yeah, time. I'm yeah, I'm terrible yeah. at it. If you want me to get prescriptive, the most prescriptive thing that I will say is, you know, be really active, sweat, um, do some hard things, do some fun things, do some fun things that are hard, um, like, you know, climbing trails, yeah. challenge yourself, have a pet, hang around with people of different ages, chase around young people. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to make a prescription for, for fasting. You know, I don't think that um, eating super late night dinners is, is great um, for me. So that, I have, me. that means that yeah. I have a fast built into my 24 hour cycle. If I'm done eating by, you know, 7 PM or something and I, you know, eat at the next is 7 AM, then there's 12 hours in which my glucagon is running and my liver is doing, you know. I've tracked it. If I eat after 9 p.m. via my whoop right here, if I eat after 9 p.m., I it has the same negative effect on my recovery, my sleep, my HRV, and a couple other biometrics as if I have one serving of alcohol. It's pretty interesting. Wild. 
as pretty Interesting. well. Me personally, again, yeah. N equals one, study of one. Yeah. Um, I do want to ask a couple other quick questions yeah. around NAD before we kind of yeah. begin to get to the end. I'm thoroughly enjoying this uh, conversation. Thank you. We want to take it exogenously. There are yeah. a lot of different ways to do that now, and a lot of people in the biohacking optimization space, and I'm one of them, um, choose to. What are some of the best ways, what are the best ways to take NAD? Not How can we take it? Um, IV, intranasal, injectable, capsule, okay. walk us through that. So, okay, so a, a while ago, we were talking about the cycle of life, right? That um, we're eating plants, right? Or we're eating the animals that ate the plants and we're getting our protein, fat, and carbohydrate, right? Uh, those plants and animals are also running metabolism they also have NAD as the central catalyst of their metabolism. So when we eat food, whole food with a small w and a small f, we're getting not only macronutrients like protein, fat, and carbohydrate, we're also getting micronutrients. Mm -hmm. We're getting NAD coenzymes in our food. NAD is the cycle of life. It's gonna be broken down into vitamin forms, right? The biggest piece of NAD that can get into a cell is called nicotinamide riboside, NR. Um, in 2004, so 20 years ago, Biagnovsky and Brenner, so the coming out of my lab, we discovered the vitamin activity of NR. We discovered that um, cells can not only make um, NAD from nicotinic acid or nicotinamide, which have been basically in the food supply since the 1940s, um, they can also make NAD from NR, okay? For about the last 10 years, or even more, um, NR has been commercialized by Chromadex, from, for whom I'm the chief scientific advisor. Um, it's safety tested, it's orally available, it's the way your body's expecting to get NAD precursors, right? Because normally we're eating food, mm. we're breaking down the NAD into NR, or something even smaller than NR. And then those vitamins are going into our cells and they're going into these pathways. When we exercise, we're ramping up the gene expression of the enzymes that are making NAD. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's actually synergistic okay. between dietary NR and boosting your, your, your NR. So you're gonna get a boost of NR from taking a precursor orally. Okay. Now, I've also read that NAD has a short lifespan, and as we age, we begin to create less of it anyway. So are, is it, does it behoove the general public to take NAD exogenously? So, so yeah, there is a use case for, for, for NR in, in, um, in, in aging better, um, you know, in promoting DNA repair, Seven um, clinical studies showed anti-inflammatory effects of NR. Human trials? Human trials, not, we're not talking mice here. There's hundreds and hundreds of mouse <laughs> studies. Um, you know, um, there's mouse studies in which it, you know, modestly extended, you know, mouse lifespan, but I don't make those kinds of claims because you can't really do the human trial that would, you know, that would measure that, right? And so, but we, the use case for NR is promoting repair. Muscle tissue. Um, like after a workout? Um, yeah, so in, in promoting workout recovery, anti-inflammation. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that we did in our lab is we showed that a coronavirus infection disturbs the NAD system. Makes sense. And that like there's five different enzymes that get activated as part of the innate immune response to the virus that degrade cellular NAD supply. Really? People looked at that study and they registered clinical trials and there were um, positive results showing that NR combined with other over-the-counter ingredients um, accelerated time to recovery from COVID. Wow. And there are other trials in long COVID and COVID-related kidney disease that are looking at NR mm -hmm. as well. So I'm pretty excited about that. That's fantastic. Yeah. So um, so the use cases are, you know, there's athletes that are 20 years old that take NR mm -hmm. because they're in a contact sport. Um, so is taking exogenous, exogenous NR preferred over taking exogenous NAD? 
So, so because NR is the biggest piece of, of NAD that can enter cells, you know, it's orally available, right, as a, as a, as a supplement. And it's safety tested as a, as a supplement. Um, you know, Nige and NR is the stuff that went through all of the safety testing. Mm -hmm. um, there are people that take oral NMN, NMN is just gonna be converted to NR. Also, you don't really know what you're getting if you take NMN because um, it's actually been sort of banned by the FDA because NMN is being tested as a drug. Mm. Um, what about injectable NAD? I, I've done that a lot at home. Have you done it? Yeah. So um, I, I have love not, the way it makes me feel. What may be happening in NAD injections is that the body is interpreting intact NAD as some type of a lytic process, like an inflammatory mm -hmm, process, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that's mm -hmm. how, you know, like intact mitochondria and ATP and NAD get extracellularized in an infection. Cells basically blow up. Right, right. And then right, yeah. I think that what part of the painful effect of NAD is um, that there's a kind of an inflammatory, but it's not really going to benefit your cells until it breaks down to N right. into NR. Any company that I'm associated with is gonna do safety testing, mm. you know, and it's gonna have some data behind it before something is introduced. And so um, I would, in terms of injectables, I would wait until there's some mm. data and some safety and you sort of know what you're injecting. So what, what about the new kid on the block? I know there's one now you can do NAD intranasally in like a spray. I don't. I don't like new kids on the block because um, I'm not talking about the, the, the group from the nineties, but, um, but I need to see safety data. And I okay. don't think that those kind of companies do do safety. Do you think that delivery mechanism um, has potential? I'd like to see data, right. you know, okay. so um, I'd like to see safety first basically. And um, you. so, you know, and I mean the clinical doses of, of Niagen are like a gram a day, mm -hmm. right? The thing is that um, it's orally available mm -hmm. and it's safe. And um, and th that's where the safety dossier is. And the, and the clinical dossier is for sort of a higher dose NR, like a, a gram mm -hmm. a day. And, okay. you know, that's kind of what, what pro athletes do and what, um, you know, clinical trialists that are looking at anti-inflammatory effects or effects that, you know, in, fatty liver or skin repair are, are going to mm. be looking at, at a gram a day. Yeah. Well, I would like to ask one more question before sure. my final question. Sure. And again, this has been a fantastic interview. Mm -hmm. and I feel like, I feel like we got another one coming. Okay. Like I was sharing with you earlier, my uh, episode with Dr. Lou Ignaro, who discovered nitric oxide in the human body has been getting a lot of new attention, especially on the YouTube channel, which you guys need to subscribe, like comment, all the things. Before I get to my final question, yeah. if we could summarize our conversation and boil it down to one statement about NAD mm -hmm. that you would want everybody to walk away with having the highest level of understanding, but also like a tool or a concept to actually apply it in their life, what would it be? NAD is the central catalyst of metabolism. It comes under attack in conditions of metabolic stress. Um, you can boost and maintain your cellular NAD with oral NR. Um, Niagen being the safety tested gold standard material. Um, and that um, don't be too prescriptive about your mm. um, lifestyle. You wanna have the most active lifestyle that you can have that brings joy to you and that you can do consistently throughout your life. Love that, love that, thank you so much. So my last question I ask mm -hmm. every guest, uh, the whole point of Everforward Radio is to bring on topics and guests and have conversations around unique areas of our well-being. We are multifaceted mm -hmm. creatures and there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat here, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual mm -hmm. well-being. How would you define those two words, ever forward, to live a life ever forward? What does that mean to you? And kind of through your expertise and your life experience, what does that look like, feel like to you? Um, Part of it is um, questioning received wisdom. 
right? Um, ask, asking questions and realizing that there are questions that haven't been asked before, that there are things that we assume to be true that haven't actually been tested or challenged. Um, and the other is to, um, you know, to love one another and to, you know, care about other people, to seek the truth, um, but to seek to help people and, you know, to not be selfish and to not be overly prescriptive. And to not extend the life of podcast disease. <laughs> All right, let's nip that in the bud. Um, I hope I'm not contributing to that. You know, I, I'm, I've been doing this for seven years. I have to take myself out of the equation. And well, look you know, people tell too. me the people <clears throat> that make the defense of, of podcasts will say, well, you know, I put my earbuds on and I take the dog for a walk or mm -hmm. something like that. So, um, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, people are learning, right. People are educating themselves by listening to, um, expert views and they're also, you know, climbing the San Gabriel mountains or mm -hmm. something at the same time, then it sounds great. Um, if they're going into little rabbit holes where they are falling in love with sciencey sounding mechanisms and coming away with the idea that they need to have very prescriptive um, dietary habits mm -hmm. or uh, lifestyle practices that they can't actually achieve because they have childcare and other things, then, then it's yeah. not helpful. So, yeah, I love that. Um, well, Charlie, thank you so much. All Appreciate right. You. My pleasure.